Hi everybody and welcome back to Nick Talks. This week's amazing guest is Tevi White, who's a member of the Gender Parity UK project. He's going to talk about that in a minute. I contacted Tevi, or more likely he contacted me, after the podcast I did with Mike about Paternity Fraud UK. And the Gender Parity UK project has a little bit of a crossover. It's looking about equality of men and women in the UK. And is it fair? And especially, is it fair to men and boys? But we'll get into that in a minute. So first of all, welcome Tevi to the podcast. Hi Nick, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for coming along today. It's a pleasure to be here. So, most people who get involved in a project like this usually has a personal story about what changed their life, what made them want to do something different to help others. Do you have a personal story? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> basically, I came over from Australia to, to live here. We had all, the, all of our children here. And I was working in the banking sector in um, emerging markets, oil and gas banking. Um, when we uh, separated, uh, it was a particularly nasty separation. The litigation lasted about eight years um, involving the children. And um, at uh, one stage, they were, well, at the end, they were living solely with me. Um, and so I went from this, uh, I've been through several positions as a father, I've been as a as a married father in an intact family, as a, as a non-resident father, and as the father who's, uh, who's resident with the children in, in the sole care, as a sole parent. And uh, I've recently married, remarried as well. So I'm having a, an uh, experience as, a, as part of a step family. So I've actually seen different grades of father, but through the family court experience, um, uh, I came out of that thinking, you know, this is blowing me. I mean, I'm quite an educated person. I'm certainly competent when it comes to um, to documentation and, and legal matters. And yet, um, the the underlying mendaciousness towards myself as as a, as a male and the willingness to believe anything bad that could be said about you was quite shocking. And um, give give us a taste of what I don't mean a personal taste. We have to go into the details of your case specifically, but. Give us a flavour of what it was like being a man in the court, the paperwork, the bureaucracy, the fact that you feel no one believed you, the, the feeling that it's it's everything is on her side, not not equally on both people's sides. Give us a taste and a flavour of that. Well, you know, there's a, there's a family court itself and then there's all the stuff that goes around it. So it's, it, for many people it was Kafka's. We actually had local authority involvement with us um, as opposed to Kafka's. And um, the, the hostility was from the, the, the social workers um, mostly. And what you find, or what one finds, or what certainly I found, was that the school and the institutions um, would, uh, would, would follow the mother's lead. So if the mother was kind enough to say everything's, you know, we're just separating, it's fine. If the mother says I'm being, you know, uh, you know it's, it's, I'm being abused or whatever, the, the, they rally around her and protect her um, before any facts are found or anything. So it's very easy for false and exaggerated claims to isolate you, not just from the children, but also from all the institutions around the children. Um, getting medical records, seeing teachers. We had a counsellor for a for our child that I was organising, and they said, "Well, you know, yeah, I will communicate with the mother about what what happens." And I said, "Like, well, with us?" And she said, "No, just the mother, not you." <laughs> and, you know, I was about, you know, it was it wasn't something that was required or mandated. I just wanted to provide it for my child, but the 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 institutional mistrust and distaste of men. And that was a UK school? That was, a, that was yeah, that was delivered through a UK school. So um, they, they, uh, they outsourced it to a, um, to a counselling provider, but it was the school that was going to provide it for, for him. Um, and, yeah, we, what really uh, tipped me over the edge, I think, in terms of getting involved on a broader scale, it was when I saw the risk of harms report by the Ministry of Justice. 
And um, I've had experience with um, with emerging markets and, and uh, unreliable jurisdictions, you might call them, and how 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 it happens that, say, Rosneft could um, could confiscate an asset that was owned by Shell, you know, and what the processes are. And it's never, you know, they don't just come in. Well, obviously in Africa, sometimes they do come in with, with guns or whatever and take it over. But what they actually do is they, you know, they have a report that uh, purports this thing. You know it's wrong. You can see the science is bad. But it's the, it's the pretense. It's a, it's a well-structured pretense. When I saw the risk, the risk of harms report, I really realised that it was that that's what was happening here in the UK, and I was quite shocked by it because that's the first. So what was this report saying? Um, this report was um, uh, it was looking at the risk of harms to children in private law proceedings, um, and well, that's sorry, not the risk of harms to children. It was the risk of harms in, uh, to uh, to people in private law proceedings. The risk of harms report, in fact, barely mentioned children, which is supposed to be the paramount consideration. It was all about protecting the women. And you know, there, there's so much wrong with it, not, not least that they, they surveyed thousands of people for it, but 80% of them were women. And so um, naturally, you know, as I, as I said to someone else, if you surveyed 80% leave voters and 20% remain voters, you wouldn't necessarily trust a conclusion that we have a problem with immigration. You, know, you, really, you, you need a balance. There's 50, you know, at least, you know, it's just about as close to 50-50 as you can get, men and women who are in front of family court. But the, the focus was entirely on, on, the, um, on the women who had already had their facts or their allegations tested in court and had failed Right, because they were complaining that the family court did not isolate the father from them, uh, from the children, because and so obviously the family court had looked at their case, looked at the evidence, and said, okay, it's safe enough for the father. You know, whatever you're saying, um, and so you had uh, it, it, it was just so poorly done. It was almost as if it was engineered to get a particular result, which is what I suspect may have happened. And um, the literature review was also appalling. It didn't reach, meet the standards required for, the, for a civil service report. Um, so I actually, uh, I actually tried to get a judicial review done to it. And, um, the, and it failed because the judicial review said, no, this is an independent panel. And the independent panel can take whatever advice it wants. It's not the government's advice and the policy has no legal effect. But it is, of course, having a legal effect. It's feeding into all the policies that's taken in the judiciary. It was created in order to have a legal effect. And um, uh, it, 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 was a, it was a rather piece, it was a piece of elegant structural acrobatics that landed this that I would have expected to see come out of Russia or Ukraine. You know, there really was that, it was that level of, um, not, I've got to choose my words carefully because I don't want to slander anyone, but it was that level of constructed, um, uh, I'm afraid you're just going to have to cut that out. I don't have the words for it. It was that level of, let me see if I've got let, let me let me see if I can describe what you mean. It was a deliberate report to get the result they wanted to influence the court proceedings the way they wanted to be influenced. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's that's entirely correct. And that's essentially it's it's um it's this is a, uh, and I've since discovered this is just a, this is a battlefront in a much lighter war, and the, that war is in epistemology, the, how we know what we think we know. And this is based on... Is that what epistemology means? Because you lost me there with a big word. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. How, how do, like, it's, it's sort of like, how, how do we know what we think we know? And there's, there's essentially, there's two, uh, there's two parts to it. There's, there's our subjective experience. So if I say, I... Let's just take the gender, the, the transsexual debate. Uh, if I say, I feel I'm a woman, right? That's a subjective statement. And the objective statement is, you are a man. 
right? You, we can see that and we can test it against all these different standards. And across, you know, so many different areas now in the, in the public service, they're focusing on taking that subjective, that subjective information, the qualitative data, and, and trying to use it as if it were quantitative, as if it was an objective, properly assessed analysis. And that's what the risk report was. And it was a real, it was a real shock to see the, the appalling lack of standards of professional conduct that was put into this. And of course, being a panel, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't obliged to follow any professional conduct. And so they didn't, obviously. <laughs> and I've uh, seen the... these same people come up in very powerful positions of determining where the family court is going. And it's, it's, it's problematic. Yeah, I think the underlying problem here is really from the 60s onwards, we've painted women as victims. And all government policy, all government projects, the, the, the social narrative is always painting women as a victim of something. So therefore, laws, social norms are always trying to compensate and trying to protect women. But in this incident, it's now led to women having the upper hand in lots and lots of aspects of society, especially in a family court, especially when it comes to children and the upbringing of children without a father. I've worked on the streets now for two decades. Biggest problem we have in this country are fatherless homes. And what we've done is we've incentivized women to be single mothers by paying them extra money for not having a man in the house, by giving them social housing. And we've made it completely normal and therefore it's a choice for women. And if we're looking at believing women, I mean, you remember the hashtag a couple of years ago, believe all women. I mean, yeah, what, yeah, a, yes, yeah, what a complete yeah. crock that was. I've got a personal story from a family member of mine. I remember as a teenage boy, a fam my auntie um, split from husband um, and the family member told her that when the husband calls at the door next, rings the bell, she should open the door, she should rip her blouse open and she should start screaming. And when the police, when the neighbours phone the police, the police turn up, she should say it was attempted rape. That's how you sort him out. And these were sensible women having this discussion. It's as if the gender wars has become, a, well, wars are there to be won. And it's a game and it's about what can I do so I win? And women have got the upper hand in, in all of this. Yeah, well, I will point out that when you when you talked about that, that was that was actually the danger of using subjective experience rather than objective data. That that, that the subjective, I, I, you know, what what is the standard here? The police should come over and say, I don't know what happened, but the, you know, but the woman, the 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 argument that you're hearing from the from the um, uh, from the various commissions that put in place is no, we should just be like believing women we should you know if they tell us how they feel that's what's really important so we see this coming through in, in a lot of the free speech stuff how do you feel is it offense is it, is it an offense what you feel this way so it's the subjective test and it's um it, what, what was really strange when i was doing this work for the um for the harms report i came across dr Adrian Barnett, who I hadn't heard before, she was the author of the um, literature review. But one of the things she said really struck me, and she said that um, that this wasn't in the review; this was somewhere else. She said, uh, "You know, that there are feminine ways of knowing, as opposed, <laughs> you know, as opposed to objective." She said that objective, that objectivity and impartiality were masculine traits, and feminism presumably is is something different. That this is subjective kind of uh it's magical it's, it's magical they, they, they've got that fifth eye they can look we used to call women like that witches and burn them <laughs> so they, they can't they can't have it both ways and when, and when we're looking at the law about domestic violence here's a tip for people i had a friend who moved into a block of flats in, this, in manchester city center and he, she was completely completely annoyed with all the parties going on on the friday saturday night in the block of flats couldn't get to sleep and she figured out if she phoned the police, they weren't interested. If she phoned the council on Monday morning, they really weren't interested. So what she started doing was she'd phone the police when the party started and she would say, there's domestic violence going on at number eight in the block of flats. I can hear 
her screaming and he's turned the music up to drown out the screaming and the place will the police will turn up within 30 minutes and she did it that many times no more flats eventually had parties because because they'd be knocking a door from the police they were worried about the smell of cannabis were they taking you know snorting cocaine there were so no one had parties in their block of flats anymore that's how you can use bad laws to manipulate what you want yeah yeah and you know that's you know fair game to them it's up to us you know it's up to us as the, the public to make the the laws and to ensure that our mps make the laws and you know if, if we don't make good laws then um people can take advantage of them if we don't make good laws it means we have bad laws yeah and who yeah, wants to live in a society with bad laws mm. Yeah, that's right. I'm I'm quite uh, concerned. I think now with the um, with the free speech um, issues, and particularly with the um, uh, <clears throat> with this legal and harmful that's kind of provision. Because if you, if you take my dog, right, he 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 has a problem with joggers, right? He lives in he's only got his subjective worldview, right? So to his world, the jogger is something dangerous. I can't tell him, I can't communicate to him that's anything different. And it struck me that the difference between subjective reality and objective reality, the interface between those two issues is, is speech. And so if you wanted to enforce subjective lawmaking, it's necessary to stop free speech and um I, I see these these things sort of connected in this way if you actually look at what people complain about it's people taking on these subjective views um say for instance uh, transphobia saying no actually you you are a man it's an objective ob observation and they're trying to you know they're pushing to make that to outlaw that as a, as as an issue of free speech so that the subjective reality can can rule and um but that's been a lot of pushback on this and I, I can't i can't see this going forward what theresa may said just a couple of days before she was elected uh voted in as, as prime minister somebody asked her about this and she said there's going to be no no new laws that there's going to be no laws that criminalize speech online that doesn't come into effect when it's face to face. Okay, that's pretty good. So that so, that, so, so we've got there. two years of that. <laughs> well, she could be gone by the end of the week. The way the way yeah, the Tory party exactly. just falling apart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's embarrassing. Don't we deserve better than what we've got in our leaders and our politicians? Don't we used to be the greatest country in the world, and this is the best we can produce now. It's downheartening sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't think it is the best we can produce. And I don't think it's even the best that the party can produce. I mean, if you have a look at um, the uh, this this stuff seems to come out in the hustings. We were very. There are a lot of people who are very keen on people like um, Kemi Badenoch to take up the leadership. I would have voted for her, and that got closed down by the establishment of the. Um, of the Conservative Party, essentially. The MPs wouldn't let her, would not support her. And I see something similar with uh, Tulsi Gabbard over in the, uh, in the Democratic Party, I mean, a rising star that um, people were very excited about, and we ended up with Joe Biden. So there is, you know, I'm not saying that Liz Truss is anything, but uh, is anything bad or good. She inherited one, one hell of a you know, basket of snakes. Um, but uh, so certainly, there is something there where the, the the choice, even of the conservative the conservative members, probably would have overwhelmingly supported um, Kemi Badenoch for for PM. And um, but it's this this higher level elite establishment that um, is seems to be fearful of change. Yeah, people don't like change. People would rather go with an incompetent person we know because we know what to expect, rather than a, comp a competent um, enigma 
that we don't know what you're going to do. People will always go for what they know because it's it makes them feel better. So now, now that you give us a bit of a brief understanding of where you're coming from, you're a member of a project called Gender Parity UK. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because when I first saw that heading, I actually thought you'd be a female and you'd be a feminist, but it's the complete opposite. So I'm glad I'm glad you're not a female and a feminist. But can you tell tell me a little bit about the project? It it, it, it sounds fantastic. It sounds exactly what we need. Well, yeah, there's a there's a number of different measurements where where um, there there are discrepancies in in the equity. That's the that's the measurement of outputs. Basically, um, it's slightly different from equality. At the moment, we're just struggling for equality, equality of opportunity. But equity of outcome is not quite the same as equality of opportunity. Um, I think we all believe in equality of, of opportunity, but equity of outcome is a, is a useful yardstick to measure, you know, or to identify areas where there are deficiencies in, in the way that, um, that society is operating. Um, <clears throat> which, which may or may not have a, have a good cause, but there is a number of areas such as homelessness, uh, male educational attainment, um, <clears throat> um, prison populations, um, criminalisation. Oh, yeah. Drug addiction, alcohol addiction, being murdered, being assaulted, um, dying at work. There's a whole dying lonely. Yeah. Dying, dying earlier. And being the non-resident parent, which is of particular interest to me. So I sort of come at it from the family law point of view or the family court point of view. Um, but, you know, what it really is sort of a group delves into examining why that is and then um, petitioning uh, different government initiatives to be, to be conscious of, of inequities and inequalities. Because some of these things are unforced errors. There's no particular reason why men are the majority of, um, uh, of non-resident parents. Uh, each, each parent is equally capable of looking after a child. So why is this happening? And, um, and that's an equality issue. That's, indi- that's identified by the equity issue. Yeah, well, that for me, the reason why we have that is because, tell me if I'm wrong, but in the family court, the starting point is the mum will have the kids. And then you've a father then has to then combat that and work from that position where an equal opportunities position would be, we're going to start with 50-50 parental sharing here. That's the starting point. And then we're going to move depending on the evidence we hear today. That's where it should start. But it always starts with mum has the kids. Let's start from that position. That's not quite correct. It starts from what is the status quo? So it says, what's the position at the moment? And then <clears throat> it tends towards uh, a stable environment where one parent is uh, a non-resident seeing them you know, once every two weeks or perhaps a little bit better than that. Um, and that's if there's no you know, allegations of abuse or anything. Um, and, uh, and that is coming from uh, some very dicey analysis. We actually were in a position where there was a movement probably about 10, 12 years ago that shared care would be the norm. Um, and uh, that got quickly shot down by the judiciary, saying that, um, pardon me, it got shot down by the judiciary saying that, you know, that will only be in a very, you know, 50 50 care. Care shared care will only be in a very minute, uh, very very small number of cases because what's important is not the time with the parent with each parent. What's important is that the child has uh, the same house most of the time and, and is stable, etc. And it looks like that that doesn't really have much of a substantiation, uh, a, a substantive basis. Um, and it looks like 50-50 shared care is the means by which we are most likely to achieve minimal harmful outcomes from separation for the children. But getting that message into the judiciary just is an absolute open battle. We can write to them, we can put pieces of, uh, we can put notifications in, et cetera. 
we can we can point them to the to the science that, that supports it. Um, but it is an entrenched stereotypical bias within throughout the system. It's a system wide issue you, when you whether you're talking to um, social workers if you're talking to you know teachers if you're talking to um to lawyers uh, the, the assumption it's a societal issue it, it, it society is society yeah, thinks yeah. kids should be with them all hmm. i don't even know if it's if it should i think i, I think it's more kids are with their mum. i don't think it, it's not not what should happen or what shouldn't happen it's just oh uh, well, that's that's what happens. <laughs> you know, it's sort of a, it's sort of an accepted outcome rather than a um, rather than necessarily a desired outcome. Although certainly, some of the feminist movement would argue that it is a desired outcome, which is quite strange for them. Yeah. Well, the, the feminists would, would argue that the last fifty years we've we've already proven that children and women don't need husbands and fathers. We've already proved that. Look how well single parents are doing in this country. Look, look you no, know, they're working, they're paying taxes, they're bringing their own children up. They don't need men. When you get men in the house, they normally beat you to death. So what's the point of taking that chance? That's the radical feminist point of view. It is strange, isn't it? Because if there's one thing that's actually going to stop you from, one thing that's going to, Put a hole in your career as full-time care of a child, and, they, and one of the Spanish studies on uh, on EBT, which was finished only last year, and the, the study of it was, but something like ten years of longitudinal data, which is fantastic, um, was that uh, the EBT stands for equal pair shared parenting. The EBT regimes, um, uh, the the women were substantially better off financially. They were more likely to be employed. They were more likely to be uh, to, to have a greater income, despite the fact that Spain has got well, quite excellent welfare systems for, for single women. They would still out-earn <coughs> a full-time stay-at-home mum. There was very little difference to male incomes. So in, it, was the, it, it had the effect of giving the, the, the two people combined uh, a pay increase of ten percent, which is you know not, which is pretty good. And of course, the women had uh, more leisure time; they were more likely to get into new relationships. I think, and <clears throat> there was just uh, there was a better outcome for the women. And you really <coughs> do have to query the intentions of the um, of of those that still object to equal parenting time who claim to be feminists. <coughs> Pardon me, because they're not they don't seem to be acting for for the children, they don't seem to be acting for the mothers really. Um, who who exactly are they acting for? And the answer is no one. They're just acting against. You know, men want this, so we're going to we're they're going to fight against for them. themselves. Femin I've become I I've, I now realize feminism is a trade union for other feminists. That's yeah. all it is. It's a power grab. This is all power. It's a power grab. Yeah. So what else is Gender Parity UK fighting for and want people to look at and highlight? Um, we're very concerned on the domestic abuse front about, um, about what's being um, portrayed for men. Um, <clears throat> we are concerned that there is... Uh, massive insufficiency in, in service provision for male victims of domestic abuse. We feel that there's a big problem with recognition of male victims of domestic abuse. For instance, they're more likely to be the victims of parental alienation and, um, and false allegations of abuse. And in particular, there's this tendency to call a person a victim immediately upon allegation. So the accuser is called a victim straight away, and the accused is called a perpetrator, and that's leaked into the CPS documents. It's leaked into um, uh, throughout the system. It's totally prejudging, completely on subjective basis, as we as we talked about before. But it creates a uh, you know <clears throat> uh, it creates a circumstance where you're not very likely to have. Uh, sympathy or empathy for the actual victim who is the victim of the, 
the false allegations. The person who's being made these false allegations against is being pilloried by the police. And it's called, uh, they call it legal and administrative aggression. And what happens is if you can make a false allegation and you can get the police involved to, on your behalf, punish the person. I know a guy <coughs> who's been arrested six times, all NFAs, who was in prison, who was in jail for a while. He, he tried suicide. It was just absolutely devastating on him. And it was it's simply this woman who just wants to cause him pain and harm. And he hasn't even been appointed an IDVA, uh, an independent domestic violence um, uh, assistant. Um, he hasn't had any support. Police aren't interested. No one's no one's following up on this. And this you know domestic abuser is basically just uh, absolutely free to to continue her campaign of abuse against him. And yeah, you know, it's it's very tough on him. Fortunately, most domestic abuse people eventually grow out of. But um, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's it's a horrendous position for him. Yeah, I've I've, I've actually done some research on this uh, for a new book I'm writing that'll be out next year. And from what I've read from you know proper government studies, is fifty percent of all domestic violence is where the man and the woman are equally to blame. One day he's hitting her, next day she's hitting him. It's just different days, different times, usually alcohol related. So 50% of all domestic violence, they're both to blame. And then the other 50%, the majority of that, it's the woman hitting the man. The only difference, the only difference is men are more powerfully built. So when a man hits a woman, there's a lot more damage. When a woman slaps a man or scratches a man, there, there's not much evidence there. Um, and I think a lot of this comes down to, you know, many, many urban myths. You know, if you look at the film Colour Purple, Colour Purple is all about domestic violence, the big bad man beating up a woman. And this goes through a lot of our soaps, a lot of our uh, social narratives, a lot of our stories and books people read. It's this continual narrative that men are big in evil and are always picking and beating women up and it's completely untrue there's a tiny 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 majority there's a tiny tiny percentage of men who may hit women but that it's completely tiny there's there's it's such a complex area um i i the data that i've got which was based on a u.s uh, uh, united states assessment was 70 percent bi-directional abuse of which, um, of which, uh, about, and the remainder, the remainder, thirty percent was about evenly split between the, the men and the women as the instigators, and of that seventy percent, um, there was a roughly equal split of about fifteen percent for male self defence and female self defence, and this was, of course, under the American um, uh, concept of uh, of domestic violence, they call it, in which the included non-violent violence if you like <laughs> and we have a different way of looking at it. we have domestic violence we have domestic abuse and domestic violence the the old you know man in a stained singlet drinking beers and you know getting a, a beating up his wife that's way down that's way down on the year 2000 it's like 70 percent down just on the year 2000 and these ngos that were set up and receive a lot of government money to protect women uh, are all of a sudden looking at a graph that's going like this for their for their market basically, and you know if you know, you might have a not for profit entity, but that doesn't mean you're not for profit, <laughs> and that doesn't mean you've not got a fantastic gold plated pension. Yeah, two hundred and sixty thousand a year. Yeah, yeah. It's the same in the charity sector. So you know you'll, you'll have um, children in need, not children in need. You'll have um, you know save the children or or some of these others. And what happens is once once they see that they're solving the problem, they then have to redefine the, pro the, the problem so they can continue. So they continue with their great wages and their pension. So therefore, we'll never solve poverty because the second we get close to solving poverty, they'll redefine poverty and we're back at square one again. The whole thing's a con. Oh, I wouldn't say it's a con, but it, it's... It, it... <laughs> As you approach that asthmatote, right? That's as you as you get to the point where 
there, there's some level of domestic abuse that you're absolutely, or domestic violence that you're, that you're probably never going to get rid of. And that's, you know, the seriously mentally health, mentally disturbed people. Um, there's definitely psychopaths out there. Um, so, you, you know, but the closer you get to that asthma type, the, the less growth potential you've got and the more shrill the voices get. It's so much harder for me to say to you that, um, that uh, someone having a bank account is domestic abuse, right? So that's, that's what we're coming into now. If you have your own bank account uh, instead of a joint bank account, well, you're economically abusing the, 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 your partner. <laughs> Come on. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's getting close to that. And, and that's about redefining what domestic abuse and violence is so, so the projects can continue running. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but also, that's really hard to convince you that that's actually domestic abuse, right, as a, as a, as a lay person, right? So what we're finding is, the, I believe, the voices are just getting incredibly shrill and very vocal, and they won't tolerate anyone saying, well, hang on a minute, that's not really that bad. You know, and it's getting more and more forceful because they are just trying to make you accept the false narrative that domestic abuse is increasing when in fact it's 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 fallen off a cliff and it's continually going down. And um, that's that well, let's be honest, that's that's great news. I'm glad domestic violence is falling off a cliff because you know, no man should hit a woman and no woman should hit a man. Um so I'm glad that's falling off a cliff. I think we've got time for one more issue uh, gender poverty UK is is trying to highlight. We're really looking at um, at the issue of boys' education as well. That's a big thing I've been looking at for two decades. All the kids, all the boys I've worked with for two decades on the streets, trying to keep out of crime, trying to improve their lives, 98% of them have either failed at education or are failing at education. Yes, yeah. And uh, there's a big question over whether schools are properly set up for, for young boys. Um, I mean, this, it's only a 200, you know, formal education is only 200 years old, roughly speaking. And um, to, to think that we've actually cracked that nut is quite, uh, you know, it, it would be quite the assumption. I was listening to a very interesting podcast on modern wisdom recently, um, and it suggested that what's actually happened is that um, you know, as, as we've removed barriers for women to be educated, we've actually found that uh, they are more suited to the classroom environment than boys are. And um, an interesting, a really interesting statistic was that to, to have the, uh, the, the self-control of an eight-year-old girl, guess, guess what age you'd have to be as a boy to have the same control as, I think it was an 11-year-old girl. Oh, very good, 25. Yeah, <laughs> which, is quite, which is quite astonishing, really. So it, it looks like boys are, are falling behind in their attainment because they are just slower to develop in that particular realm. They are developing very rapidly in different realms, of course, but the, the particular realm that's cherished by, uh, by a uh, structured school society, um, it's, it's just not working out for them or for many of them. Let me push back a little bit there because... I don't think it's that they're not able to compete in those classrooms. It's the fact that over the last 50 years, our education system has completely changed. Our education system now is designed by women, run by women for the benefit of girls. And we see that through primary school, secondary school and university. The, the whole idea about state education, and I'll argue this with people all the time, is was to prepare young people for a working life. And somewhere along the lines, it changed, and now it's education by itself is wonderful. Got nothing to do with going out and earning a living and being self-sufficient. It's now about learning is itself the reward of being in school. And I can see some points of that, but for me, complete rubbish. I don't care if you enjoy school or not. I want it to prepare you for the real world out there. So you can get a job, earn your own money, and you know, be a man, be a woman, and survive by yourself. And the reason why the education system has changed is not only because it's run by women, 
but it's also the mentality there as well. So we have lots of women who from all over the world now, you know, India, everywhere, who go to university, get a good degree and then do nothing with it because it was just something to do. And that's what our education system has become, something to do. The boys, the boys I work with can't sit still in the class for six, seven hours a day learning. They want to be up. They want to be doing things. We, we need a whole new set of schools, especially for boys, where they're up, they're doing practical st stuff, they're working with their hands, they're training for a career, an apprenticeship, not waiting until they're 16, 17, I'm talking about eight, from 11 onwards. We're letting the whole generation of boys down because we're treating them like girls. We're, we're, we're criticizing them for not being like girls. And then we also then shame them for failing in life. And it's because the system's set up for girls and not boys. Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't suggest that there's anything uh, nefarious or, or anything intentional about it. I think it's just the way it's, it's just the way it's it's fallen into th this pattern, of course, because you know uh, the the number of male school teachers has fallen right off a cliff. M women mothers have a different parenting style than fathers. Uh, women are much more protective. They don't want to see people hurt themselves. Fathers tend to want to see their children taking on risks and, and developing new, uh, sort of challenging themselves in a physical sense. And I think that that's come, I think that, that has boiled down as the, uh, as the teaching profession has become more feminine, the, uh, the restriction on rough and tumble play has come down. A lot more. I mean, I can remember when I was a kid, we used to play, you know, mugger ball. There's something like 30 or 40 kids, one ball, and lots of ripped shirts, <laughs> lots of mud, <laughs> lots of mud in the face, and you know, you're bruising and cuts and everything. And you know, it was it was good fun. It was, it was, a, it was a riot. But um, then I found that ADHD, a good thing to work against ADHD, is rough and tumble play. That, that actually sort of uh, you know, seems to have some positive effect in minimising ADHD. So it was seen as the profession has feminised, ADHD increments has come up. And that, well, that, that's if ADHD actually exists, because the medical community are, are still out on this. I think a lot of these new syndromes we have now is about placing a label on children, especially boys. So you can't behave in class so it's either your parents' fault, your fault, or let's find a label so it's no one's fault. Oh, you've got ADHD. The, the truth behind it is you're probably poorly brought up or that environment is not for you where you want, you've got excess energy as a boy. You need to burn that off. You need to be competing with other boys. You need to, you need to be working out your social standing in this group of boys, not sat there going, Let's be kind. And is it time for a group hug yet? Yeah, Boys, put your hand up. But not <laughs> girls. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And boys get, there was an interesting set I saw the other day that boys tend to get into the paper. Boys, they have fights, they end up friends. Girls, they have fights, they're, they're, they're enemies for forever. Forever, forever, but, yeah. But boys, boys will have fights, and the most common outcome is that they'll be friends. <laughs> so it's just, and that's it, because they're, they're just different. Yeah. Historically, We're just different. when you have a fight with another male, you have to become friends because for two reasons. The first reason is if he's defeated you, that means he can kill you the next time. So you better watch out. And the second reason is I want him by my side when the evil hordes at the gate of our village. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's probably there's probably a lot of different reasons. Um, but uh, I, I just, you know, it, it, it's obvious and makes sense. It's just nice that someone's done a paper on it. <laughs> you know? But it's, it's, it's stuff that you know. I mean, uh, have you got kids, Eric? You, you no. No, okay. Well, I've had... But, uh, but, but, I've, but, I've, worked, but I've worked with 20,000. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I've, had, I've had daughters as well as sons, and you know, they're just different, you know, and there are elements that, um, uh, that you like about each of them, but, you know, it's... it's it's a different way of being, if you like, a different way of being human. Well, here's, a, here's an example. So I work mainly with antisocial children or dysfunctional children on the streets. So if we have an extremely dysfunctional young man, you know, 15 years old, 
and we have an, an equally dysfunctional girl at 15 years old, the girl is a lot easier to fix and to get progression down a path. And the reason is, doesn't matter how dysfunctional she is, she has much better communication skills. Ah, yes, yeah. And there's also there's also something that I, I said to someone else earlier, which is if you're a man and you run into a room screaming, if, if you're if you're say sitting there with your with your five year old kid, yeah. a man runs into the room screaming, your instinct is to protect the child. Yeah, he's a threat. If you if you're sitting in the room and a woman comes in screaming, yeah. your instinct is to go up and help the woman, protect her because she's obviously a victim. Yeah. <laughs> She's less likely to kill you. <laughs> but you, we perceive her as a victim. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't perceive men as victims. So if you come across a man in distress, the institutions, the society, will always treat it with suspicion because, first of all, the first of all, they've got to work out whether he's a threat, you know, and um, and then you know if he's not a threat, maybe we'll help you something. But usually, if he's not a threat. Well, go away then. <laughs> we don't have to deal with you because we've got all these threats to deal with. <laughs> it's it's a difficult thing for for boys uh, growing up that they are they are given all these um, they are required so socially now to behave so much more like girls, but they're given none of the leeway, none of the leeway for for acting out and well I, I think i think they have to act more like girls and women because that's all they see because education is run by women so many come from single parent households which means the mum um, and not a lot of the boys i work with have no idea what it is to be a man to to know you've got to take responsibility go out to work be a protector and um, they're just copying what they see and what they see is a female world and it's, it's destroying many of them. Hence why they turn to gangs, turn to violence, because it's a way of them expressing their masculinity, which isn't toxic, by the way. But they need they need to get these things out of them. So therefore, they turn to the gang members because suddenly they're in that male environment where there's a pecking order and there's consequences when you misbehave. And young men crave that. All children crave rules and boundaries so they know where they are in life. Well, especially if it's framed in sort of like this masculine concept of um, sacrifice. The military is so good for children and uh, I really, well, for boys especially. Um, well, we, we used to have the scouts, but now the scouts is boys and girls. They ruin the scouts. Every time men find something for themselves to be men, women have to invade it. With, with cries of equality. It's like, can we not have anything for ourselves? You know, you've seen the projects of men in sheds. Mm -hmm. So yeah. them now are being invaded by women. And it's like, <laughs> can, can we not have any, can we not have any space where men can just be men, where we can pick our yeah. nose and fart and tell, and tell hey. <laughs> without <laughs> women being there. It's, it, it, yeah, especially the banter side of it. Like, um, you know, because so much of so much of um, male communication is taking the piss out of each other, being totally offensive, like horrendously offensive. <laughs> I can think of some of the conversations we had as children, as teenagers. And all that now is a hate crime. Men, men can't do what they need to do because it's a hate crime. It's absolute. I don't know where the solutions to, to all this comes from. Um, I, re I really don't know where. Where the change comes from? Mm. Well, <clears throat> it's it's it, to, to circle back onto the education issue and how we do that. I think <clears throat> you know we've got to you know that is a really tough nut to crack because um, uh, the the school system is actually quite it's well set up to be a, a feminine person and um, whether whether you're a boy or a girl if you're femininely if if you're feminine if you're inclined towards those feminine attributes, you'll find school easier. Um, and so, uh, you know, what do we do about that? Uh, that's a big question. One question, one thing that's been put up is that you, you start boys a year later in school. And so they're just a little bit more mature, a little bit more able to... Um, again, again, that that's punishing boys again for being boys. 
what we need is we need a whole new raft of schools. Whole new raft um, of secondary what, schools. Like not co-ed or, or, or no, not, sex? Or? No, no, again, can be co-ed, but the more technical schools. So you do English and maths, but then all the other lessons uh, are more technical, you know, bricklaying, um, coding, um, a lot more lessons that are stood up, activity, um, doing activities, a lot more teamwork, a lot more bonding, a lot more pecking order of where you fit in. Um, and we get those children ready for a working life because 18% of kids in England leave school and have failed education don't have the minimum requirements of an education. 18%, that's one in five. And that's across both sexes, is it? No, it, 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 there's some girls in there, but it's, it's heavily boys. Um, but we failed them. After 11 years of education, we failed them. And they need a different type of education. So let's keep the education we've got, because it benefits girls. It'll benefit some boys. Great. I don't want to disadvantage girls. But let's build something new for the boys that that will fail that type of education. Well, there, there is there is that, you know, and certainly the the technical skills, good qualified technical people are the backbone of the economy. Basically, it's very important to have them. Um, but also, uh, I was thinking more on the primary school level, um, have, having more opportunity for for rough and tumble play and for activities like that, the, where they can get out. Let less pressure on schools to, you know, not have any injuries, you know, just more accepting that there's going to be a couple of injuries because you know, boys will be boys and they'll be, they'll be pushing themselves. Yeah. Well, I used, I used to be a school governor at primary school and every, every quarter we'd get a report of bullying incidents. So, so, it's, 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 so it's not even a save the rough and tumble, rough and tumble pay, play, but, you know, we were getting bullying reports Someone said something nasty to somebody. Someone did this. Someone pushed someone. And it's like, these are these are the skills children need to learn to solve themselves, not be running to teachers. Um, the whole setup, like I say, is, is over-feminized. I was thinking that um, women affect um, change in the world by, by convincing men to, to do it, to do the jobs, basically. I mean, uh, that sounds sounds awful. I don't know a better way of putting that. But um, if if a woman wanted to, well, if, if a female queen wanted to invade another country, it would be the men doing the fighting, for instance. But at a very lower level, um, if a if a pregnant woman wants to wants to you know stay at home with the kids, she's going to have to like convince the man to go to go and work and, and provide for her. Um, and so that that tendency to appeal to authority in order to affect a change, I think, is a feminine instinct more so than a masculine instinct. The masculine instinct would, I'd suggest, be more towards solving the problem yourself. And the that that we get into these these primary schools and these children are being enforced and forced and forced appeal to authority don't take responsibility for your own well-being ask someone else to intervene and that's that's a message i don't think that works very well for for boys developing their ability to deal with the world by themselves because the chances of them convincing another man to look after them is, is virtually zero. <laughs> you know? And, you know, so men have to be self, have to be independent. We do. We, we need, we need boys to be men and we, we need to show boys how to be men. And that should be going on at the home, but it doesn't happen at the home as much as it used to, especially if you've not got any male role models. School doesn't develop it. TV doesn't develop it. You know, a lot of the male characters on TV now, the fathers are the fool, are the joke, the butt of the joke, Homer Simpson, um, Family Guy. It's very rare you now see a positive male role model. The only place we see them really is in the Marvel Universe. Um, and that's where we see some of those male characteristics. And even the females have male characteristics as well because they're trying to be superheroes. Um, I think that's a great place to leave it for today. 
Uh, let's all right, all right. That, on the positive that boys should be copying and trying to be Marvel superheroes to protect <laughs> themselves, protect the families, and protect society in general. Uh, that's the that's the that's the role of men to be heroes. And when you have a hero, we remember you forever, and we sing songs about you, and we put you in our myths and legends. It's uh, it's immortality, isn't it? It is. It's a type of immortality. No, Terry, thank you very much for coming on today. Great conversation. Lots of lots of things to discuss there. I'm sure some people won't be agreeing with some of the things me and you have said. Um, but but we need these conversations, and it's the only way we're going to get to the truth. Yeah. All right, mate. You take care. That's great. See you, later. See you soon. Thank you.